Hi, everybody. It's Joey Remini from seekingbalance.com.au. I'm a vestibular audiologist and I'm a neuroplasticity therapist and I'm the author of Rocksteady, the book about healing vertigo and tinnitus. I really enjoy supporting my clients through building their new normal and taking back control over their sensory system and observing how they meet uncomfortable feelings and dark places within themselves to change their relationship to their body and to build their new normal based on what they desire to feel and following that thread of pleasure and owning and reclaiming how they want their life to look and feel. This is where I live and love and work. And today I want to extend this conversation to talk about sexuality, sex, pleasure, and sexual trauma. And what I've noticed in the Rocksteady and Seeking Balance community is that many of my clients with chronic invisible elusive symptoms like tinnitus, dizziness and vertigo, there is a history of trauma. And a lot of people haven't known what to do about it, how to talk about it. Um, it's, they may have actually had a lot of trauma therapy, but it's still unresolved. And they're coming to me and their body is still screaming at them. And their body is telling them something's not right. Something doesn't feel right. I don't feel safe. I'm still not safe. And that's impacting the nervous system, physiology and re-triggering symptoms, symptom cycles, and these maladaptive coping strategies. So learning about trauma and how to be part of honoring and owning our trauma story is really deeply a part of some of my community's rock steady healing process. So I wanted to talk about it more to normalize it. And if you're out there listening, going, I just feel stuck. Like I'm trying to find my desired sensations, but I'm stuck. I'm blocked. It's not working. It could be there's a story stuck inside of you that's screaming to come out and it's an old suppressed trauma pattern. And part of your healing will be really, really gently meeting that and, and allowing that part of you to be listened to. So I have a beautiful guest today. Her name is Dr. Holly Richmond. She's the author of Reclaiming Pleasure, which is a book I would highly recommend to my Rocksteady community. Um, and it's it's all about having a whole person human approach to sex, to pleasure, and a deeply compassionate approach to meeting our trauma. And Holly is a somatic psychotherapist and she works to help us understand our body, to reclaim our story, to rewrite our story. Um, and I want to say, Holly, to get back our sass. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I'm really delighted to meet you and to share this conversation. So you're also a certified sex therapist and sex tech consultant, which maybe you can explain a little bit what that means. But first of all, welcome. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. I, um, yeah, your email was one of those emails when it shows up in your inbox, you feel it. Um, there was such a resonance right away. So I, um, I'm just sitting in so much gratitude that you reached out and our communities have an incredible amount of overlap that I think you and I don't even know the depth of yet, but I'm excited to, to kind of unravel that even more as we speak. So I've decided I'm going to do the brave thing, Holly, and I'm going to talk, share my story with the audience because that's how I met you. Mm -hmm. So this is how Holly and I have, have come to be on this chat. Um, I experienced a sexual trauma at the age of 13 and I had no language for it and I didn't feel safe talking about it. So I did what most, what most of us do and my body very cleverly suppressed it so I could carry on living and functioning. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my 30s that it came up in a therapy session out of the blue. And the therapist said, you know, that was sexual abuse. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and at that point, I did actually tell my mom, so I would have been 32 by then. And my mom's response was, oh, no, that's not abuse. That's just teenagers being curious. So it dismissed and I suppressed it again. Um, I had two really beautiful births, home births. They were quite blissful and ecstatic. And I think that's a credit to all the work I'd done on in my rock steady path of um, trusting my body and relaxing and owning my space. So I didn't have birth injuries, but through birthing my second son and through just the, the cracking open of vulnerability and the beautiful, rich hormones, my old trauma started surfacing. 
and that did impact my my sexual pleasure as well I could feel a direct link between these frozen parts of me and that impacting my nervous system as far as sexual pleasure went so things changed um but not a physical trauma I had absolutely no physical birth trauma so this was it was clearly kind of emotional um I want to talk a little bit about attachment theory as well, which you talk about in your book, because when I go back and, and look at the memories that are surfacing, a lot of it was around, for example, my dad would force feed me. And sometimes it was quite aggressive, like, and my no meant nothing. And so here's this major male figure in my life, forcing things in my body repeatedly. And I, I'm like, wow, that's not really very good consent training. Like when I think about it as an adult. But, you know, he's got his own story and food for him is love. He was forcing love down my throat because he grew up starving and hungry and in a refugee camp. And, you know, so he's got his own stuff. But you don't know that as a kid. So from a neuroplasticity point of view, my neural pathways were like, my no doesn't matter. And then there's another memory that comes up. And I, I, I talk about this because I feel like there's a lot of subtle things that happen to us that we dismiss as not important. And my experience of healing this and meeting this and reclaiming my purity and reclaiming my pleasure is actually they do matter. And it's important not to dismiss the small stuff because not all traumas are big traumas. Um, so another of the smaller level of traumas that came up um, was being in the, about the back of my dad's car, maybe eight years old, and him forcing me to kiss one of his friends goodbye. And I really didn't want to. And he had like a yucky mustache and he smelled and I just didn't want to kiss him goodbye, but I was, I had no opt out. So I had to do it. And I just thought that had that yucky feeling in my body that this is wrong, this isn't right, but I don't have a voice. And again, my dad was benign in it. He wasn't trying to upset me, but it's that subtle messaging. Um, and then with my mom, I couldn't talk about things. I was pushed away. If I went for comfort, she could say things like you're impinging on my personal space. So when I look at my 13 year old who'd experienced non-consensual, non-consensual penetration, had no idea about sex or foreplay, any of that, and kind of went from my childhood to having sex happen to me. I mean, there was just no way Joey could talk to mom about it. She, Mum wasn't available for lots of things. And that, that was like a really big thing. Um, so first of all, I just, you know, I had to go back and feel the sadness, the sadness of that younger part of me. And so from a neuroplasticity point of view, I had to complete the hurt and the sadness. And as Holly really beautifully ex explains in her book, I had to reclaim my story in it. Um, which included getting a bit angry at my parents, you know, going, I actually advocated for myself. It was um, a Friday night, late night in a park. I was 13 and teenagers drinking alcohol in Dublin city and I'm Australian. So I was thrown way into the deep end. And I said to mum and dad, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to go. There's alcohol and sex. And I was 13. And they said, Oh, don't be so ridiculous. Go play with your friends. It's a church group. <laughs> so you know, just on so many levels, my voice didn't matter. And, um, you know, I, as an adult, my parents are beautiful people and I deeply respect them, but they had their own traumas and they had their own blinkers on and they didn't want to see it. They didn't want to talk about it. So I get it. But this is, this is part of the healing. It's kind of having compassion for the broader story, but not dismissing the hurt and the shame, which, which Holly will talk about. Um, because now when I look back at my life, I realize I never had an opportunity to get excited about sex, to talk about it, to be like, oh, what will it feel like to talk about it with girlfriends or to have really healthy, grounded conversations about feeling pleasure in my body? You know, it's been very recent in my mid 30s that I've given myself permission to really talk about it and explore it more because I've been more frozen and I've been in that fight, flight, freeze around sexuality. Um, because I, I kind of didn't get to mature into it. It happened to me too young. I didn't understand it. So that's a, that's a little bit about my story. And the only other thing about the attachment theory I thought that's kind of useful to mention for listeners, because I think it actually plays in with intimate relationships, sexuality and pleasure, is my parents, while they 
like I say, they're beautiful people and I deeply respect them. They were inconsistent and they would be scary at times. And so as, as a little child, I didn't have a safe person to go to. And I, one minute they'd tell me that, they're, that I'm amazing and they're proud of me. And another minute they're sending me to my room and telling me to go cry over there. So there was a lot of inconsistency, um, a lot of unprocessed trauma in both of my um, lineages, maternal and paternal. And so as a little person with a developing brain and as children, we can't self-regulate our nervous systems yet. We have to piggyback off our parents. We have to co-regulate, hopefully with a securely attached adult. So from attachment language, you know, I had disorganized attachment. I didn't trust my body. I got very good at reading other people's cues and doing and saying and behaving in ways I thought that they needed me to be so they were okay. And if you put that into a sexual situation, it's like, I'm just thinking about the other person to, to make sure they're okay. Right. So this yeah. is where I mean, there's overlap. Um, and this is really rife in the chronic illness community that for whatever reason, and that's why I'm sort of sharing my story. So you can perhaps explore your own. We get trained to not listen to our body and to dismiss what we feel. Cause a lot of my childhood, I remember feeling like I would advocate for myself and say something but the adults around me were like, no, no, you don't feel that. Go away, build a bridge, get over it. You'll be right. Just be happy. Enjoy the moment. Like just a lot of invalidation and dismissal, which was teaching me not to have a voice, not to listen to my truth and to make sure other people were okay to prioritize their emotional space. Exhale. <laughs> um, there's so much to unpack there, but first and foremost, thank you for giving me the language to reclaim my sexual trauma story. I had never done that. Um, and I encourage listeners to do it because it's powerful. And really, really quickly, actually, I actually discovered Holly because my 13 year old came back to me and spoke after 25 years of not being available to me. And what she said to me, this is, this is my inner 13 year old in my imaginal space. And this is me sitting quietly on my own, not in a therapy room. She came to me and she said, Joey, I don't want anything to do with that memory because I spoke up and I said, I didn't want to be there. And I'm going to go back. And this is in my imaginal space. And I'm going to say to mom, I'm scared. I don't want to go. And mom listens. And mom says, that's okay. You don't have to go. What would you like to do? And she says, mom, I just want to bake cupcakes and stay home on a Friday night. And so we bake cupcakes. And I have two sons in the real world, but in my imaginal space, I have a spirit daughter that talks to me all the time. And my spirit daughter came. So there's three generations of women. It was mom, me, and my spirit daughter. We're baking cupcakes. And my 13-year-old self says, I really want to talk about sex. I've got questions. I don't understand it. And we have this really healthy, grounded, relaxed conversation that's fun and playful and full of eros, which you will talk about. Um, this, this sense of discovery exploration possibility excitement it's free of trauma and like that was so healing and so my 13 year old said to me talk about it let's talk about it and from that I googled podcasts and found you and here we are <laughs> that is amazing amazing oh Joey thank you for sharing that um I think you just told millions of people's story yeah I know you did I know you did mm. And to uh, just to piggy off the back off the work you do um, and the work I do, we so often think something is wrong with us, but that's the wrong story. It's that something happened to us. And as soon as we can sit solid, solidly in knowing something happened to me, my body's not misbehaving. It's trying to protect me. It's trying to tell me something. Yeah. That's when we begin the process of healing. Um, and that sexual healing is part of our overall healing. There's not like my sexual self over here and my, you know, my overall self here. Sex and self are not dualistic. They're, they're one in the same. And we really have to treat them holistically and with compassion and care and certainly shamelessly. Yeah. And even if we think about sensuality as the sister word of sexuality, mm -hmm. our way of being in the world is through our senses. Our senses inform us about the world what we see, what we smell, what we taste, what we hear, you know, our, our felt sense of the world using our vestibular system even. And if we don't feel safe in our senses, that's when the whole nervous system kick in and fight, flight, freeze. And we think, oh, okay, like, is it a weather change? Is it, is it 
some kind of tribal violence? Is it a, a lion or a tiger? And, and we go into that problem solving phase. But if we're actually afraid of ourselves and ashamed of ourselves because we feel something's wrong with us, which is exactly the case with chronic symptoms, my, my clients will hear their tinnitus or feel their vertigo and it will trigger that fight, flight, freeze patterns of shame. Um, and it's really hard to, well, it's not really hard. It's, it's a journey to learn how to interrupt it and, and recognize that, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with me. My body is on alert looking for a problem when actually the solution, coming back to this term of eros, which I'd love you to speak to, okay. is about exploring possibility and, and shifting the shifting the approach away from this rigid judgmental I should be this and I should be that and I'm abnormal into well what if this is the perfect me and what if this is my body communicating something valuable for me and what if there is deep insight strength and healing through this process of listening yeah exactly yeah I really feel like it's impossible to study sexuality if we're not studying eroticism and I have to um, give credit to Esther Perel she was really one of the first people to dig deep into eroticism and Jack Morin to um, one of her mentors so I really I want to point to both to, to their work but eros or when we hear this word eroticism we think it's sexual and it can be, that's wonderful. It can be sexual, but it's translation was literally to life force, mm -hmm. vitality, vivacity, creativity, mm -hmm. co-creation, these types of words. Eros is how we move through the world. Yeah. Eros yeah. is flow state. Eros um, includes integration, which I describe as our mind and body being on the same page. Because when we're chronically ill, when our sexual trauma is repressing pleasure, that's not integrated right? That's rigid. It's the opposite of eroticism. And eroticism like, is free. Yes. Yeah. And I was just about to say, it's like, it feels like the word should just goes way out the window. Yeah. And I, and I want to say living with a two-year-old, they are just amazing teachers of Eros. Yes. Because, yes, they are. You know, like you could be laying down in bed, it's six, seven in the morning and it's like, come, you want to have a quiet cuddle in bed, you know, to keep the lights down. The two-year-old comes in, jumps on the bed, flashes the lights on and off. It's, it's all play. It's all random. And just, you know, I could step into, it shouldn't be like this. And, you know, I could be rigid, which is actually really the parenting I experienced. But mm -hmm. I'm like, actually there's value in playing and flowing with it and being welcoming of some of the random toddler absurdity. And it lightens my heart if I can say yes to it. And I, I, it's the unlearning of all the rigidity that society puts on us. Right, right. And you spoke beautifully to consent earlier. Um, Joey, you know, I practice everything from a sex positive approach. Mm -hmm. So all sex is good sex, as long as it's consensual and pleasurable. So there's literally two boxes we need to check. There's no shoulds, there's no sex needs to look like this. It's not my body needs to look like this. It's not if I have a, a kink or an interest that isn't totally normal, that that's bad. Just consent, just pleasure. And with eroticism, it's really enthusiastic consent. So the two year old with the light switch, that's enthusiastic. You know, when our little ones see their shadow and it's so exciting, that's enthusiastic. And that's what I would love everyone's sexual experiences to be. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, there's, there's so many, so many places we could go with this talk. I'm curious if we speak directly to someone who's listening and they're like, Hmm, I have this not quite right feeling in my body. And now that I'm aware of what it is, right. So now that I'm not dismissing it anymore, I can be like, hmm, I can respond to this not quite right feeling in my body really quickly, really elegantly, really graceful. I'm now securely attached as an adult, but I had to heal the disorganized attachment. So I'm thinking to people who are listening, who are sort of on the journey of becoming securely attached to honoring and listening their body and going, I think I do have something back in there in the backlog of my life where it wasn't consensual and it wasn't pleasurable. What do they do with that? Do you want to speak to um maybe giving people some language around sexual trauma and sexual violation and absolutely and you already spoke to um little t trauma and capital t trauma so capital t trauma is going to be um typically a, a violent situation where you are very physically or emotionally hurt 
um, capital T trauma leads to PTSD. So where we have the flashbacks and where we literally felt like our life was threatened. Yeah. Now, little T trauma, which we're studying more and more, leads to complex PTSD. So a little T trauma is just trauma after trauma after trauma. And Joey, the three examples that you gave are spot on. Mm. So trauma doesn't have to be violent. It only has to be violating. Mm. Trauma, especially when we're talking about sexual trauma, it only has to be non-consensual. You didn't need to end up with a bump or a bruise or a scar. You didn't, you probably didn't say no because you were in a free state. None of that, none of that matters. Something happened to you, you didn't consent and you certainly didn't enthusiastically consent. So remember, not violent, only violating. So when we give ourselves that understanding and that compassion, that's what leads to healing. Um, the continuum that I like to work with is awareness, understanding, behavior change. So, so often, because we're all over functioners, right? Most of us, we're just like, you know, chronically do this, do that, do that. We want the behavior change right away, but without the awareness. So I feel in my body something wrong. Mm -hmm. Oh, now if I connect how I feel to an understanding of my sexual trauma, that makes sense. Only from there can we do the behavior change. And what reclaiming pleasure does is just walk us through that three-step process of, of how to reclaim pleasure and have a healthy sexual relationship with ourselves. Yeah, and actually it's part of the work I do with my clients too, some of it overlapped about rediscovering consent, like actually start having these conversations with our body. It doesn't need to be with a sexual partner. Right. And, you know, exploring pleasure and consent, asking the body in the moment, does this feel okay with your body? Like for my balance clients, for example, when they're doing some of their vestibular exercises, just check in, is your body freaking out? Is your body actually up for this? Or do you wanna bring it back a bit, make it gentle, bring in some soothing uh, before there's a challenge or before the body's overstimulated or actually in resistance and the body's saying, I'm not comfortable and I don't really know what to do with this discomfort because my voice hasn't been heard in the past. So I'm, you know, mm. and from that place, we can't use neuroplasticity. When the body's freaking out and it's in fight, flight, freeze, and we could also talk about fawn if you like, Mm -hmm. um when we're when the nervous system's agitated and in those the stress response neuroplasticity and building new neural pathways is inhibited it's prevented it's the body's saying it's not a great idea to build an, a new pleasurable pathway over here because there's some stressor i've just got to fix out there's a problem i've got to fix first right right um, and then also coming back to exploring not just consent but pleasure pleasure can be you know feeling the wind on my cheeks or just even, you know, caressing my own hair and just connecting to that. Or um, I did an interview yesterday where I, I, I said, you know, I was just playing around with this, getting ready for the uh, talk I had yesterday and your talk today and swinging my hips and just really enjoying the rhythm of feeling my pelvis rock from side to side while I was walking to order a coffee. And it's like I was in my own little pleasure bubble and none of the world would have known. And it just felt really erotic actually it felt beautiful but it was me with me and just very simple pleasures so i would love you to speak your piece on how your book beautifully walks through both of those processes mm, thank you um i do want to talk about fawn because it's really pete walker in his book on complex trauma is really one of the first people to identify fawn mm. and since studying his work and paying attention to myself i always thought i was a freezer and in some ways i am but oh my gosh am i a fawner so mm. fawner mm. is someone who's complacent who's compliant who says yes who does what you were talking about with your parents figures out what other people need and does that um, and i think i just want to speak i don't like to talk about genders too much but women are more apt to be fawners than men, just because we live in a society where we are taught to be people pleasers and taught to be the nurturers. Not that men can't be fawners too, but there are a lot of women with complex trauma, with sexual trauma that go straight to fawn, that completely override what they need. And it's like, oh, but what do you need? Can I ask you to give an example? And I know you've done this and I've heard mm -hmm. examples. I think it's really helpful of a sexual trauma that involved a fawn response. That could be mm -hmm. useful for our listeners. Yeah. Um, so there's a case study in my book called Alex, um, and I will make this as, as concise as possible. Um, Alex was uh, 
went to a party in New York City when he was, I'm going to say 18 or 19 years old, went out, had two glasses of champagne, which was not odd for him at all, but woke up at four o'clock in the morning in some man's apartment with this man having sex with him. So um, he was clearly roofied. He was given a drug because he said he didn't drink that much and he really had no memory. So we know that, you know, something something was not right there. So when he opened his eyes and the man who was assaulting him recognized he was awake, the man got off and was like, hey, last night was so much fun. And Alex set up and he's like, hey, um, can I get you some toast and some water? Mm. And Alex said yes. And Alex drank the water, had a bite of toast, but felt like he was going to throw up, was very kind and nice and figured out how to get out of the man's apartment without mm -hmm. ringing every alarm bell of like, oh my gosh, you jerk, you were just raping me. What the F are you doing? I'm going to call the police. He didn't do any of that because he knew that that probably wasn't the smartest thing for him to do. So he played nice. He was compliant and he was just like, I'm going to say what this man needs to hear and I'm going to get myself out of here. Yep. That's Fawn. Fawn is saying yes. Fawn is when um, someone might be date raped and her um, perpetrator texts her and say, tonight was really fun. Thanks so much. And she will just talk, text back. Yep. Great. Thank you. That really screws with people's heads. I was just about to say, because we betray our no by overtly saying the yes. So it's like, we're not mm -hmm. even keeping it like a quiet, no response. Mm -hmm. We're contradicting completely what the body's screaming at us, which can then activate even more shame. Absolutely. Then it just goes straight in. Then then the survivor feels like, oh my gosh, I have no leg to stand on. I literally said, thanks. Yep, I had a great evening. I drank the water. I ate the toast. It's me that's wrong, right? And that is not the true story. That's just a, a fond response, which again is the body's attempt to take care of you. Yeah, yeah, it's... um. Yeah, I just I really feel like this is such an important conversation because the work we're doing is about listening to the body and trusting the body and honoring the body. And I want to say coming back to Eros and this life force and vitality, it's not all sexy and amazing and sensual. Some of it in my experience, and please add your piece as well, Holly, it's meeting the darkness and it's actually having those moments of like, wow, I abandoned myself there. I had no skills, tools or resources at that point in time. And, and there's, <clears throat> and this actually comes up quite a bit in my therapy with clients. So they'll be like, oh my God, I just have not been kind to myself for like 20 years. And it's like, well, it's never too late to start. And at the end of the day, we all did the best we could with the resources we had in each moment. But some of Eros and life force and vitality and the inner erotic is, is, I believe, having this adaptability and this capacity to accept reality as it is. And some of that's dark. Some of that's hard. Some of it's truth bomb conversations and reality slaps. But my experience is that feels good. It's like I had this moment of, of some of the repulsive memories coming back to me and it felt really repulsive. And part of me was waiting to find my peace with it and waiting for the bliss out neural signals. And it just didn't come. And I'm like this is repulsive. It's just repulsive. It's repulsive. And then this voice came to me and was like, Joey, repulsive is repulsive. Like you're in alignment. This is it. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. and then I could kind of let it go and make my move forwards, let's say. And I think mm -hmm. Eros is having the emotional bandwidth to experience more of being human. And some of being human is yuck and disgusting and ugly and smelly but we're no longer suppressing that or pushing it away or needing everything to fit into this nice little soft, cozy, safe window. We're, we're able to experience more of life, which is both spectrums. Did you want to speak it, to it that is. at all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Eros is possibility. Um, and I know for myself and most of my clients there, we move through the world in rigidity because that's the only way we feel safe. So not much gets in mm -hmm. and we don't just keep out the bad. We know this, right? If you're going to keep out the bad, you're keeping out the good too. So speaking for myself, I had so little pleasure in my life for 13, 15 years. And it is shocking now when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, what a shell of myself. And I feel so bad for her. Um, but it is, there comes a point of acceptance. 
Um, and I can, you know, as I've stepped into my arrows, holy crap, have I made a lot of mistakes too. By no means is like healing, like, oh yeah, I'm going to do this perfect now. Eros is much more messy than constriction, but it's a hell of a lot more fun. Yes. And my, my experience of coming out of the rigidity, and I would not have called myself a control freak, right? Because you speak about control in the book and I've, yeah. I actually screenshotted, maybe this is a good time to read it through. Um, I loved this quote you shared as well. This is um, from chapter six. And the, the quote you share is from Dalla Hicks Wilson on, darling, you feel heavy because you're too full of truth. Open your mouth more. Let the truth exist somewhere other than inside your body. Like listeners, I think this is what healing is. Like that is a really, really potent statement. I also from the book want to, um, this is a list and, you know, by all means, buy the book. And there, there, there are more of these lists and um, information for you to really drop into and relate to this conversation of exploring sexuality and eroticism. Um, so common emotional impacts of sexual trauma and really possibly any trauma. Mm -hmm. yes. um, difficulty identifying emotions, expressing emotions and regulating emotions. I mean, that's really common in my community of, of Rocksteady participants. Feeling out of control and feeling disconnected. They are really key terms people use to describe their dizziness. They feel dissociated. They feel out of body. You know, they feel like the ground has been moved, swept from underneath them. There's this loss of control and the nervous system is like, where is up, where is down? Uh, fear of unexpectedly encountering a perpetrator. I had a bit of that. I was paranoid about getting raped and I had no idea I had been abused. Yeah, it's crazy. Rumination, very common. Low self-esteem, lack of boundaries, feeling confused, feeling dead inside. I could relate to that one. Like I would feel suicidal like twice every year, despite being super successful on paper, ticking all the boxes. Um. But just this constant coming back to something is dead inside of me and something wants out. And I, and I deeply believe it was linked to this part of me that was so suppressed and unexplored. Mm -hmm. um, inability to focus, again, very common for our dizzy clients. Fear of going crazy or I want to say being crazy. Yeah. Um, diminished ability to feel pleasure, joy or relaxation, extremely common. So some of my rock steady participants will take months of body scanning and pausing and consciously spending time dropping into their body before they can have any sense of neutral feeling, let alone relaxing or joy or pleasure. So it's a really slow d descent back down into the body out of the busy fear living up in the head between the ears where the nervous system is just very active. Yeah, and, and I think how I do that, so um, there's three, parameters in, in the healing process that I created. The second one is pleasure. Mm -hmm. And Joey, speaking to what you just said, the first thing we do is help everybody create a self pleasure protocol. Mm -hmm. So that's really spending time with themselves in the bed, in the bath, on the couch, even on the beach. So this is not masturbation. I'm not saying masturbation because masturbation is typically goal oriented. It's like we're moving towards an orgasm. Fantastic if your pleasure protocol wants to include orgasm, but that's not where I started. A self-pleasure protocol is really about sensation, self-touch, getting comfortable, touching your body again. And we first start with the non-erogenous zones and then we move to the erogenous zones. Mm -hmm. The second part of that pleasure piece is if you want to, you can include a partner. And really using your yeses, using your words, that feels good. No, I don't like that so much. I love it when you grab me here. I love it when you kiss my neck. I don't love it when you pull my hair. All of these words that we just really need to learn to say to reclaim our own pleasure. So um, thank you. Just thank you for, for stepping into that. Well, and I, I want to say again, coming back to these attachment insecurities, um, and I say this specifically for my audience, because for some people just sitting alone in their body is, is like it's a panic attack, a panic attack material. So bringing another person in and asking for something just can feel like oceans away in terms of possibility. Um, but I really want to invite you listeners to allow yourself to go slowly and allow yourself to, um, to meet yourself and find the comforts and reassurance and support and I do love this concept that pleasure can be our way out. You know, pain's the way in, pleasure's mm -hmm. the way out. And I, I deeply agree with that, that sentiment. 
Holly, that we can start slowly and it can be just in our own space. And I think your book explains really beautifully that part of healing as whole people, we are tribal, we're interconnected and having another person to be witnessed to us and our process to share, to be vulnerable. Um, it's really raw and edgy, but I think it's part of that eros and possibility. And if we are very rigidly stuck in our own space and siloed, which is a, a word I would use to describe me, I yeah. siloed in and I was trained to not trust anybody, like literally. Um, so it was really, it blew my mind when I realized it, I could trust someone. That, that just wasn't on the menu for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're you're right. Yeah. Connection, connections, primacy and healing from sexual trauma is absolute. There's no way around connection. So the first parameter control maintaining and relinquishing, which I know you work with as well. The second parameter pleasure. This third parameter is connection. Mm -hmm. And please know this does not have to be a sexual or erotic partner, but there has to be some connection in your life, whether it's family, friends, church, community, the local dog shelter, somewhere where you can really show up as you and be accepted. Yeah. And I just want to speak to this re-traumatization. It's a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I tried to get support and, and figure out what was going on with me. Cause I did know there was something odd with my behaviors. When I look back over the years, little things like I was super sensitive to screens mm -hmm. and just so much of what's in the media is non-consensual. It's triggering. So I just, I didn't like going to the movies and everyone's like, why? I'm like, I don't know. Just I'm uncomfortable. Um, I hated being seen. I hated looking sexy. I would dress down. You know, I didn't want to be looked at. So I did reach out to various therapists and psychologists over the years, but it was re-traumatizing. And I often left a session feeling more complicated than understood. And so I, I say that because when you're reaching for connection, I say, I, I would say go slowly and don't necessarily assume that someone just because they're a blood relative will be a great person to connect with. You know, sometimes our family members are triggering and they are traumatized themselves and they don't have that secure attachment. So we're looking for an adult, most likely, who mm -hmm. is securely attached. And what that means is they're present, they're available. You know, they have warm and gentle and easy eye contact. You know, that was another piece. I was ter I, I didn't use eye contact at all my whole life. I've just learned since birthing my second baby. So there were little markers for me um, that something inside was wanting to be seen and witnessed and heard. And I just had to slowly keep chipping away at listening and responding and experimenting and going gently. Mm -hmm. And I think going gently is key so that the nervous system doesn't freak out because when the nervous system freaks out, the symptoms come back, the fear right. comes back, the disconnection comes back, the pleasure disappears. So in finding connection, um, I think we have to have that bravery and courage of possibility of reaching out and finding. But I think if it doesn't feel right and you feel re-shamed or re-traumatized, Gee, I feel for you um, and I feel for the parts of me that had that, but we have to keep trying and we have to keep mm -hmm. being hopeful that we will find our people, our tribe or our lover, if that's what we're looking for. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite questions to ask um, in that light is how does my nervous system feel with this person? Yeah. Right. And Joey, you and I sat down, we've never seen each other's faces and there's automatically, and yes, we're virtual, but we're automatically like, this is, I think this is a safe person. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're moving through your community, when you're with your family, when you're with your friends, with your, whoever this community is, I want you to ask yourself that question. How does my nervous system feel when I'm with this person? And that is going to be your first clue is with, is it safe to share? Is it safe to resource with them? Because it may be, or it may not be. Yeah. And what a gift when we find these people, you know, it is, it is. Um, I'm just going to check. I did a few more screenshots of your book. Would you mind if I, I share these no. with the community? Oh, Joy, I just thought on that, the, who you share with, you alluded to this, um, 
almost all therapists are well-meaning. I want to say all therapists are well-meaning. Not all therapists are sex positive. Mm -hmm. So if you do, if you have identified a sexual trauma, I would ask that you do your due diligence to try to make sure the person you're seeing is sex positive. So um, <laughs> there's a few resources that I sent Joey. Joey, you're gonna put that um, in the show notes or some, some links, I hope. But just the questions you're asking are first, are they trauma informed? and what is their view on sexuality. And um, that should give you a good sense of, of where they are. Yeah, and, and again, coming back to, I almost want to say body positive because yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it consensual and is it about pleasure? It doesn't actually have to be on the topic of sex. It's, you know, however right. you explore your inner world and your body. And a great example of this is when I was, um, I was doing these health technology sessions for 13 year old boys in a boys school, a Catholic boys school. And they asked me to come in and help their anxious boys um, with skills and tools. They didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest, but I was, I was helping them explore their body, explore their inner world. And we kept it fun and playful. And at one point we sat in a talking circle. It's me and 25, 13 year old boys. And I was getting them to access thoughts about anger and their values and their heroes and, and looking at what that meant for them. And, so, you know, some of them loved baseball players or football players or surfers or maybe their, their dad. And this one kid said um, Putin was his hero. And, um, and you could, half the boys probably didn't even know who that was. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Help me understand why, if, what's your connection to Putin, Vladimir Putin. And he said, well, Putin rides a bear for fun and Putin blows things up and I said um I said well you know what in your inner world you're allowed to ride bears for fun and it's okay to blow stuff up because nobody gets hurt it's your inner world and everybody is safe and you can have that for yourself mm -hmm. but if you were to try a ride and bear in the real world or blow stuff up in the real world, there would be consequences. People would get hurt and the police would be after you to talk about this. But you could, I could feel the palpable sigh of relief in the entire circle um, when they heard it's okay to blow stuff up in my mind. Like that's my mm -hmm. inner erotic mm -hmm. imaginal space. And I want to say that's kind of what it means to be sex positive or body positive. It's all welcome because no it's one's getting welcome. hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I just wanted to kind of give an example of what it means to find a therapist that can hold the absurd and hold whatever's going on for us from a very non-judgmental place where they're not influenced by politics or religion or their stuff. Right. Right. All is welcome is a beautiful way to say that. And for sexual trauma survivors in particular, a lot of times there's some problematic sexual fantasies that come along with that. So they may fantasize about their perpetrator. They may fantasize about gang rape. Um, so that's called, um, oh, I'm losing my words right now. Um, forced seduction. Forced seduction fantasies are one of the most popular um, seductions for all women. But when you're, you're a survivor of sexual trauma and you have forced seduction fantasies, that becomes really problematic. And again, that translates to shame. So a sex positive therapist, when you bring any of your deepest, darkest sexual fantasies, or maybe you present as straight, but you're not quite sure you are, they're going to be able to hold that space for you. Yeah. And, and, and that's really, I think the common story here is we're exploring our inner world and our inner truth. And often that's counterculture and we're having to question mainstream narratives and discover what's really going on for us of using the body as a truth barometer and having someone to non-judgmentally hold that with loving awareness teaches us how to hold that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, as, I, as I described earlier, when my inner 13 year old came to me, I was alone. I was quietly meditating, which is part of my daily practice. Mm -hmm. And she came to talk to me. And if I didn't have those skills and tools, it could have been really um, potentially difficult or triggering, but it was actually a gift and it was beautiful. And I felt vitality come back to me almost immediately having that 13 year old speak to me and she was alive and vibrant and she was telling me exactly what she wanted. And it was like, wow, okay, I'm listening to you. Um, she oh. owned her space and it was just really beautiful to be unfrozen. And uh, my husband and I have been kind of playfully joking that I'm thawing. Like I can really feel my nervous system thawing. Beautiful. And I hope you've made cupcakes. 
yeah. I actually baked apple pie because that was what I had. At okay. Home, but it felt it okay. felt playful and fun, and it was good. perfect. Um, gosh, we're probably at the end of our chat. We could definitely speak more to this. It's such a rich topic. I really want people to listening if you have not thought about sex for a while because you've just been so locked in your symptoms and feeling like getting up and having a shower is a big deal sex just feels really not on the table um that's okay and i think allowing ourselves to be where we are but to ha- perhaps indulge in the conversation or read holly's book like i think we all start somewhere sexuality is an incredible part of our life force our humanity our wholeness and if we're on the rock steady path and we're learning to navigate our neural networks and to build our desired sensations, sexuality is likely a part of that for most of us. And I think as you say in your book, or perhaps I've heard you um, mention this on a previous talk, it's okay to own and claim being asexual too. That is still a sex positive conversation and choice. But if we're not even having the conversation, we may not know that. So, exactly. You know, exactly. It's asexuality is not an omission of sexuality. It's claiming who we are as sexual beings or polyamorous and every variation on the spectrum between the two. Yeah, yeah. And they're they're really rich conversations. And I love that they make us think consciously and intentionally about what's okay with me and what lights me up, what turns me on, what turns me off. These are fabulous conversations. And I love this idea of really flirting with life. And another example of that is, you know, I'm, just on a little walk down the street and I see a tree and I find myself literally having like a silent conversation with the tree of thank you for the oxygen I'm just really enjoying breathing your oxygen and then Mm -hmm. off I kept walking but that's eros you know I was in relationship with the world around me and I feel like regaining this playful inner erotic imaginal space which is so such such a, a massive part of rocksteady um it really brings us back from the dead, I want to say. It, it, it does. I love that story. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit naughty and playful. Ecosexuals, that's the thing. I thought you were going to tell me I did. But I was like, did you want to go have sex with the tree? Did you want to have sex with the earth? There's those people. They exist. And it's all good. It's consensual and pleasurable. Um, so yeah. there's your sex positive. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Holly Richmond, I will send a link to your website, which is drdrhollyrichmond.com. Yes. Um, and I can also send some resources as well for folks um, perhaps looking for therapists and, and sex positive community. I think mm-hmm. that's really important. I'm hoping to have many more conversations fleshing out this topic for our community ongoing. So I'll keep you posted, Holly, if you're interested to come back. Of course, of course. Just let me know. Thank you again for having me. I really, I've enjoyed our talk and I'm so glad to know that you're there as a resource for my clients as well. Mm. Well, everybody, it's Joey Remini from seekingbalance.com.au. You can visit my website to learn more about my community and how to become a part of the Rocksteady group. It's a beautiful, supportive, all welcome community. Um, And yeah, I feel very nourished actually by my community. And I want to say sharing my story today, I think you mentioned this in the books, my last point, sometimes it's easier to do things for other people than for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I leaned on that a little bit. I was like, you know what, I think I have to go into these difficult and dark places, not just for me, but actually Mm -hmm. for my children and for my community. Mm -hmm. And I well, thank you for everyone who's in my community because you've been part of part of that. But it's okay to lean on your loved ones. And if it's feeling like you can't quite do it for yourself yet because that relationship's not solid enough or it feels scary, sometimes if we lean on our broader community and our interconnectedness, we can do it for the trees or we could do it for our children or we can do it for the people nearest and dearest to us so we can be solid and securely attached. We go there. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you, Joey. Much love. And everybody, it's a bye for now. Bye-bye.